Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, our February webinar series. This is the second uh, session of the year. I am Anza Ramabrana from the University of Johannesburg and the University of Venda in South Africa. And I am your host for today, and I'll be co-hosting with Daniela today. She will introduce herself shortly. And um, please remember to follow our social media pages on Twitter or X. It's EMN underscore MedSoc for the Metabolomic Society and uh, EMN uh, Committee. And then for uh, the International Metabolomics Societies at Metabolomics SOC. Uh, please follow us there on the EMN page. There's a lot happening. Uh, there are travel advisories, advertise. There's an ECR networking that is also advertised. So a lot of exciting activities on our social media uh, page. Uh, if there's anything that you want to inquire or on, it's info dot emn at metabolomic society dot org that's how you can get hold of us and today we have uh professor dr maria federova who will be presenting for us i will hand over to uh daniela to introduce our speaker we are very excited and we hope that you engage with us in the chat box in the q a box please leave your questions we'll get to them at the end of the session and read them out as dr uh, Maria answers some of those questions. Daniela, you can just introduce our speaker. Thank you, Alexa. Uh, well, I'm a postdoc researcher from New York University, uh, also a clinical fellow from Argentina. Uh, along with Alexa, we are both EMN committee members. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Maria Fedorova. She is an associate professor for Lipid and Research Center of Membrane Biochemistry and Lipid Research at the University Hospital and Faculty of Medicine, Carl Gustav Carus of the Technik University in Dresden, Germany. She has studied biochemistry at St. Petersburg State University in Russia, and she obtained her PhD at the Faculty of Chemistry and Mineralogy in Leipzig University in Germany. There, she was a group leader at the Institute of Bioanalytical Chemistry. And in 2021, Maria Group moved to the Center for Membrane Biochemistry and Lipid Research in Dresden. Maria research is focused on understanding the mechanisms behind plasticity, adaptation, and maladaptation of natural lipidons in response to different stressors and using innovative mass spectrometry and bioinformatics solutions. Her group looks at the lipid quality control machinery at subcellular, cellular, and organismal levels. Maria also serves as a vice chair of Pan-European Network in Lipidomics and Epilipidomics, a community of researchers interested in lipid biology and lipidomics technologies supported by European cooperation in science and technology. Today, she will be discussing lipidomic high throughput pipelines on LCMS to explore the diversity and function of lipids. So we look forward to hear Dr. Federova's presentation and hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you very much for the introduction and I hope you can hear me. And I'll share my slide. Yes, we can. Um, So just let me know that you see the slides in the correct way. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me today. And thank you for all joining the webinar. And uh, I will talk about what we do in our lab in terms of different lipidomics workflows. And I prepared for you two examples how are we address different questions in lipid research from analysis to data integration. In my group, we are interested in lipid metabolism, basically analysis and data integration. And we look at lipids at many different levels. So we look at the single, just a second. 
lipids and their role in signaling, we look at the lipid collectives to understand how they actually act in this cooperative manner together. And we look at the complex lipidomes in the respect of metabolism. Uh, in terms of basic research questions, we are focusing on tissue-specific lipidomes as metabolic units, and I will talk a bit about that today, about plasticity of lipid metabolism in variety of stress responses, lipid quality control at the different levels, and another speciality in our lab is the concept of epilipidome, where we focus on the lipid modification and particularly on lipid oxidation. In terms of biomedical focus, we apply our let's say, basic concept towards mostly metabolic diseases such as obesity, cardiovascular complications, liver pathologies, different types of inflammatory responsive chronic inflammation and innate immune responses with the idea to find pharmacological intervention targets and also to use lipids as a possible biomarker, either mechanistic, predictive or diagnostic ones. The main area of research in our lab is, um, so can be divided in several subsections. So this is a tissue lipid metabolism, and I will talk about that today, most of the talk. We also look about cell lipid quality control when we try to understand how cells can rewire their lipid metabolism in order to adapt to certain stressors, mostly in the context of redox biology stress-related responses. We also look on the subcellular lipidomics, for instance, on the lipid droplets, but also other organelles. And we also focus on oxidized lipids in the context of epilipidomics. We do that in general using mass spectrometry. So this is our main analytical tool. And we are running here several platforms. So we have high resolution LCMS set up for the deep lipidome profile. We use high throughput targeted mass spectrometry for the screening of large amount of samples or going very much targeted for specific pathways. Our new adventure, which we started recently, it's mass spectrometry imaging, where we look for the lateral lipidome resolution. And of course, with all of this data which we generate, we also have to do something. So we have to develop different kinds of omics data processing tools to support integration of this data. So we try to cover the and lipidome organization on very different scales and levels, starting from subcellular structures and up to the population-based studies. So today uh, I will show you two examples since we're going to talk about lipidomics workflows. And I will show you a little bit more analytical dimensions. How do we address tissue lipidomics and also what we do in terms of oxidized lipids in the epilipidomics research. So let's start with the tissue lipidomics. And before we move into the analytical details, uh, I would like to explain the rationale. Why are we interested in that so much? So we all know that lipids are very useful readout for the human metabolism. And you can see on this very uh, general cartoon, which you can find in any textbooks, the actually interconvention of the lipids in our um, circulating uh, body fluids. So we have all the variety of different lipoproteins, which are coming from or ending up in liver as the main uh, organ here. And the general lipid panels, which are available in the clinic, are basically focusing on measuring the content of cholesterol, either total or specific in a certain fraction of the lipoproteins, the total Tg contact or phospholipids. With mass spectrometry, of course, we can get a much more detailed picture of lipid metabolism. And now we can say that the higher or lower of levels of lipid, particular one which we can identify, is associated with the particular conditions. But so we can define with lipidomics technology the correlate um, <coughs> observation of correlation biomarkers. But when we look at that, I always have a question. So I can see the difference, but actually, what does it mean? So we 
want to understand this fingerprints of lipid patterns, which we can see in body fluids, how they do reflect actually this system-wide mechanistic understanding of what happens inside the body and how the metabolism is impaired. And to do so, so I would like also to attract your attention, let's say, to the state of the art and some of the missing scales in the current uh, in the epidemics workflows in general. So we, of course, all are very much focusing on the system's wide level. So measuring lipids in uh, circulating body fluids. And that is a very important direction because this is a way towards clinical translation. On the other end of the scale, we have now uh, a lot of research which is happening in the direction of a single cell lipidomics and also subcellular lipidomics. We do that to get really deep mechanistic insights of what is happening in the cell and also to address heterogeneity, the biological heterogeneity of events which are happening in cell populations. But we also have this black box in the middle with organ and tissue lipidomes, which is often much less addressed than the other two scales, which I mentioned. But tissue lipidomes are extremely specialized. So you could see here just an example made by Sida in our lab, uh, where he performed analysis of uh, lung, brain, and liver lipidomes. This is experiments from mice models. And you could see on the principal component analysis how different these lipidomes are. So how the far, the more far away they are from each other, these dots, right? So the more differences in this whole lipid composition. To show you a little bit more visual way, CIDA is also very good in making TLCs. And you can see here that if we look on the total distribution of lipids, lipid classes in lung, brain, and liver, we can easily visually see that there is a huge difference between these different tissues and organs. And here is an example, which is probably even more dramatic. This is the glycerol sphinger lipids, which are very uh, much present in different way of species in brain and much less represented in lung and the liver here. So why do we need from our point this reference lipidomes of human tissues that to answer the following question. So how much do we really know about the lipidomes of different organ and tissue? Can we use, without this knowledge, a blood plasma lipidome as a readout of tissue dysfunction? And it's also very important to address the specificity of lipidome remodeling in age, sex, and ethnicity-dependent manner. So maybe many of you know this resource, it's called Human Protein Atlas, where nowadays, after actually tremendous work by the community who is um, doing that, you can put the name of a protein and you could see the distribution of this protein in the different organs and tissues, both on the uh, transcriptome and proton level. So we might imagine that one day we will come to the point where we will see the same kind of information for the lipidome composition of different tissues. So for that, we need this tissue reference lipidomes, which will provide a qualitative and quantitative inventory of a lipid molecular species, in particular tissue and organ in physiological and pathological conditions. That will help us tremendously to understand the tissue-specific lipid metabolism, so the biology of this tissue, the biochemistry of this tissue. We can also address then better lipidome plasticity and remodeling when we have the adaptation events and when it's actually maladaptive and come to the dysfunction. And of course, it will be also significant for the future clinical translation uh, for prevention, diagnosis, and intervention. So this is a rationale why we are interested in, in looking deep into the different uh, tissue lipidomes. And uh, we are working on different tissue for now and made some work before. And now I will focus a bit on the analytical part. So how do we do that? So you could see here a very 
generic representation of different steps which we undertake to, in order to profile tissue lipidomes. So I will go into more details in the following slides, but basically four main steps which we have here, we start with a deep profiling and accurate annotation of the lipidome of interest. Then we go for the design of lipidome specific mixtures of internal standard data extract, uh, batch extraction and data acquisition and data processing and quantification. So I will show you in the following slides some details on uh, all of these major steps. So usually we start when we want to address a normal a new tissue which we did not analyze before. And this is a workflow for really in-depth profiling. So it's not a high throughput work here. That comes later. So we start with optimization of tissue extraction, and for that we used a pooled sample, which represent all groups to be studied in this particular situation. And in this step, it's very important to find the most uh, suitable way for tissue homogenization, but also for the extraction. So maybe not all methods will perform in the same way. When that is done, we go for the comprehensive LC MSMS analysis of pooled samples. And here we can employ the whole variety of LCMS combinations. So we use reverse phase chromatography, C18 columns, C30 columns. We also use a helichromatography for the more polar fractions, so something what we cannot resolve here. And that comes in the dead volume of the column here. And uh, in terms of mass spectrometry here, of course, we also to go to the different uh, techniques. So we are using iterative um, data dependent acquisition. So the idea of this whole method here is to get as many as possible high quality MSMS spectra, which will allow us structural identification of our lipids of interest. With all of this MSMS spectra, which we can obtain through these different analytical approaches, we go for the accurate annotation of lipid molecular species. We used software assisted solutions, and uh, also we perform additional, let's say, uh, steps to ensure accurate identification. For instance, we can plot a Kendrick mass defect plot where we have the Kendrick mass of identified lipid. I can remark the fact, sorry, of identified lipid by hydrogen, for instance, or plotted over the retention time. So, and the lipids of the same, let's say, family would form this wonderful trade li uh, trend lines. And if you see some spots dots out, that is a possible outline and the further inspection of MSMS spectra is needed. So nowadays we do most of our identification with the software LipoStat2, which is also implement in which the Kendrick mass defect plots are also now implemented. After this uh, long way of going with the annotations with multiple LCMSMS analysis, so from this one pooled sample, uh, we have this descriptive inventory of tissue lipidome where I can describe how many lipids of different um, classes are present. And uh, since we invested so much time in this deep annotation and curation of our lipid molecular species, I would also like to attract your attention to the resources which we have on our website. Uh, which are free to download by everyone. So for instance, we have this detailed manual for lipid annotation. It goes like for 60 something pages, class by class, describing the fragmentation pattern. It's also provide for, uh, examples of MS2 spectra in positive mode and negative. It uh, lists different characteristic fragment ions, which needs to be considered here. Also examples of KMD plots and so on. So if you are interested in looking at the MSMS fragment patterns of lipids, so feel free to go and download this file and use it for your research. Uh, when we have the full descriptive picture of the tissue lipidome of interest, that of course already very interesting, and we can see the distribution of different lipids, is there a, uh, how many species are of this and this lipid class, but in the end, without having at least some way of quantitative information, which allows us to see what is happening in this particular lipidome, it's not that useful. So obviously the next step, which we go here is for 
quantification so where we can reduce our relative abundances of the lipids within the uh, lipidome. Here comes the next challenge since the tissue lipidomes are so different uh, there is no one mixture of internal standards which would fit to all of it. So in most of the cases, we go for the combination of things which are premixed mixtures, which are available, for instance, splash lipidomics, um, single lipid mix, but we also spike on the top of what is missing there or represented in a very different quantities than we actually expect to be in this lipidome. So, and this is important step where we perform this customized adjustment of the internal standard com mixture components. So when we have a list of the lipids we want to have in our um, internal standard mixtures, the next point is at which concentration, at which quantities do we want to spike it in this particular lipidome? And to uh, figure out how uh, much to spike, yeah, we perform first a six-point calibration curves where we add the concentration. For instance, this is an example where uh, you can see the uh, phosphatidylcholine from the splash mixture. So it's spiked into this matrix, which we started in the six different concentration. And then we are plotting the abundance of our endogenous lipids. So they are in gray dots and also our internal standards which we added and we are finding the concentration the one which would be in the middle of our dynamic endogenous range so that allows us to define for each lipid in our standard mixtures the concentration amount which we want to spike in this particular lipidome and I think also now uh, it's also available in the lipostar as well to do it automatically uh, afterwards, we perform extraction of all samples in the studied cohort where, and in which we spike in each of them the tissue of internal standards which we defined in the previous step. And there is also some tricks or something to uh, be careful about because we have to randomize our samples. We have to generate different types of quality control samples. So batch QCs, if we cannot extract all samples at once, and usually we cannot, and the total QCs preparation and so on. If you're interested in more details about that, just let me know. And then we run our LCMS analysis. And the sequence, how we do that uh, for uh, this cohort sample. So we start with uh, column equilibration and uh, then we run our blank QCs. And then we load the column with the total QCs several runs in a row, just to equilibrate column to this particular matrix of interest. Then we go for the dilution of the total QCs, where which allows us to control for the linear response ranges for our endogenous analytes. And then we go for the acquisition of our samples in MS1 mode. And then every 10 samples, we inject the total QC. So the design is um, at the first moment might look complicated, but otherwise it is actually very uh, simple and logical. So we have to address all our QC samples and then go in for the sample acquisition. Unfortunately, after we've done all of that, that is not all we need to do. And now we come to the point of the quantification uh, or analysis, uh, integration of our signals to reflect the quantities. And there are several other steps which we need to take into account. We have to correct for the class specific adducts and in source fragmentation. This is very important in lipids because I, here I show you just one example where we can see the variety of triacylglycerides. This is example from the real samples from a deposed tissue. And the triacylglycerides here listed in the uh, order of increasing carbon number in the acyl chains and within each carbon number series with the way of increasing amount of double bonds. In a blue here, you can see the input of the iron M plus ammonium, which is the most uh, NH4, right, plus, 
And this is the most usually considered an abundant uh, iron for the triacylglides rights. But you can see already here that is not all, because in red we have a potassium, and in green we have a sodium adduct. And you can nicely see here how with the structure of our analyte, so here a particular series of triacylglycerols with, I think, 48 carbon uh, in the acyl chains, but the number of double bonds change the distribution of the different adducts significantly. So if we would not consider in our peak integration both all these types of the adducts, yeah, so we will definitely underrepresent uh, PUFA containing Gs in this case. And the same story I'm don't show here, but also for the in-source fragmentation fragments, for instance, ceramide lipids are very sensitive to that uh, situation. The next step is isotopic correction. So we usually do type one, type two isotopic correction and also incomplete uh, correction for the incomplete deterioration of uh, uh, internal standards. So batch to batch from different variations, the amount of uh, species which have less deuterium than uh, supposed to have yeah can change here you can see some example here i think it's lpc deteriorated standard here and you can see that m minus one signal have actually quite a significant contribution and it's actually varied from uh, batch to batch so that's why we have to integrate all our isotope logs here in order to ensure this accurate uh, peak integration for the internal standard quantities. So once we did an exercise from the real data set and we calculated how much off we can go if we don't do this kind of corrections. So if we don't do type 1 correction, we can actually go wrong up to 20%. Type 2 correction can be really crucial and it can result in the miss uh, integration or a quantification up to 60%. Incomplete isotopic enrichment, the example which I just showed you here, can lead up to 28%. And class-specific differential adducts, so again here, 40G, what I showed just you now, it's 65%. Yeah, you can visually see that it can be dramatic and in source fragmentation can actually lead to even uh, higher uh, error rates. So I would suggest if you're interested in doing lipid analysis in this way, so to consider this kind of the correction. So, and again, once you implemented all of that in your pipelines, it um, then goes pretty easy. So finally, but not always, in some cases, we also calculate a response factor for particular lipid species, for instance, triacylglyceride in the adipose tissue, where there are a lot of them, obviously. To assist with the computational solutions in all these different um, steps of the identification, annotation, and uh, quantification, uh, we actually, with a, a community put together this lipidomics uh, tool guides, which you can find and it's costed by the lipid maps uh, website. And you can see here that we have this interactive map, which allows you to address different tasks in your lipidomics workflows. And if you click here, you have this different description. So databases, repositories, uh, targeted lipidomics data set analysis of untargeted using data dependent, data independent, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you are searching for the right solution, I suggest you to go to the website and there is also the paper which you can read for more explanation and just um, try out to find the methods which would fit you the best. Also, for instance, in the Supplementary material to this paper, we provide two examples how you can design your own workflow using all these different tools, for instance, for targeted data, like lipidomics, yeah? so where you create your inclusion list, you perform data analysis, you perform peak integration, so on and so forth, and also for the untargeted solutions. So important part about the lipidomics tool guide that there we show the softwares which are, are 
open for academic users. So if you are from the university uh, and uh, academic sector in general, you can actually use uh, without charge any of the tool which I described there. So a small example on how that can be used. Yeah, so very tedious workflow takes a lot of time, a lot of steps, but at the end, what we come is uh, with a quantitative description of particular tissue lipidome. I just show you an example of the paper which we published a few years back, Adipo Atlas. So it's a reference lipidome of human white adipose tissue, where we can see as a final result this quantitative representation of different lipid. Uh, molecular species in the human white adipose tissue. So we could see here, for instance, the total amount of triacylglycerols, and then each dashed line here is a particular uh, molecular species uh, in this, yeah, lipid species in this case of triacylglycerides present in there. And for all of our studies which we publish, we make the data uh, fully available. For instance, in this case, Adipo Atlas data were uploaded on the metabolomic workbench with associated metadata. And I think this is a very important step for us all in the community to share data because, first of all, we put a lot of work. So I hope some other people, and I saw already that examples, can benefit from all this detailed annotation which we did. But we also are very much depending on other data sets where we are searching, for instance, for the composition of the liver lipidome or something like that when we want to compare in them particular instances. So what we learned from this <laughs> deeper atlas um, example, actually we learned a lot, but I, of course I cannot uh, show you all uh, situations just to give you a small example here about triacylglycerols. So triacylglycerols are the most abundant lipid in white adipose tissue. This is not surprising. But what is surprising, the high molecular diversity. So on the molecular species level, we identified more than 1,000 lipids, TGs, and then we quantified them on the lipid species level with 200 plus uh, lipids. But when we plot the whole 200 lipids here, TGs here, over their concentration range and the number of double bonds, or so double bonds and carbons, Actually, only uh, 20 of them out of 200 plus uh, corresponds to the 70% of the total TG in the human white adipose tissue. And those TGs are primary contained saturated or monounsaturated fatty acid cell chain. So 20 out of 200 make really the most of that. But then when we start to look, for instance, in the context of obesity, what we see in obese white adipose tissue is actually accumulation of polyunsaturated TGs. So what we can think about that. So if we have our TG in this massive lipid droplet, either with saturated fatty acids or with polyunsaturated fatty acid, what does it change? It's change the parking density. So we ask ourselves the question, so can this poor fatty TGs drive lipid droplets hypotrophy so they are not cannot be packed anymore so dense as a saturated one and can the PUFA TG drives adipocyte hypotrophy and would that uh, correlate with the metabolic health of obese individuals for instance with insulin resistance so to answer the first question can PUFA TG drive uh, hypotrophy of lipid droplets uh, we reconstituted artificial lipid droplets where we can vary the composition of lipids in the phospholipid layer and the neutral core. And what we can see here in this model experiment that indeed, if we increase portion of puffer chains in the neutral core, we are getting a larger lipid droplets, wherever increasing puffers in the phospholipid monolayer has completely opposite effect. So, to ask, answer the second question, can PUFA TG drive adipocyte hypotrophy? We actually, uh, since another advantage of this deep lipidopsis profiling, when you did it once, you can go for the larger cohort in a targeted way, so you don't have to repeat that 
steps all the time. So we profiled a lipidome of uh, white adipose tissue and subcutaneous and visceral and obese insulin sensitive and insulin resistant individuals. So we could uh, get access also to some clinical parameters here. So for instance, uh, we were provided also with the mean adipocyte size. And if we look at the correlation of the lipid patterns with mean adipocyte size, so you could see here it looks pretty nice. And when we look for the lipids responsible for that, this is actually exactly for many of them in this part here are puffer rich TGs. So enrichment and puffer rich TGs positively correlated with the mean adipocyte size. And importantly, we can also separate lipidome profile of obese insulin sensitive and obese insulin resistant individuals. And again, among lipids which are driving this separation are PUFA enriched triacylglides roles. So this is just one example of what can we conclude and derive from this complex data. But of course, there are many other examples and stories which we derive from this deep profile. And so the story of sphinger deinine, ceramides, the levels of isoplasmalogens and cholesterol resistance and so on and so forth. So having this deep profiling give us a lot of information about the biology of what is going on. But also now having all these lipids identified and having the idea about their behavior, we can easily go, as I showed you, for the high throughput screening in large cohorts of the samples. But we also can look in this different, let's say, call it health disease continuum in lipidome remodeling. Yeah? So we can perform different clustering analysis and see how lipidome in total actually react into this metabolic challenge or this metabolic dysfunction. And this is an, actually the point which I would like to bring up here, that in the majority of the experiments we are doing, we usually uh, formulate our hypothesis using cell culture models. Then we try to prove our findings, for instance, in murine models with potential aim to validate it in the humans. And on this line, yeah, so it's becomes very difficult in the final step often. So having access to this data formulated based on the human tissue lipidomes, of course, now we can move to the models, animal models to prove some particular aspects. But I think starting from human data, we have much higher chance to find the final validation of the mechanism or therapeutic potential or diagnostic targets in humans again. So in the second part of my talk, I will show you briefly the examples of what we do into the epilipidomics field. So first of all, what does it mean, this term epilipidomics? So lipids uh, undergo a variety of different modifications, right? And that can happen on their enzymatically or non-enzymatic way. So just one example here, we have a typical lipid, it's uh, uh, plasmalogen, oh, sorry, <laughs> PE lipid, um, and it has saturated um, palmitic acid and unsaturated arachidonic acid, esterified in SN1 and SN2 position, and the ethanolamine group here. So what can happen to this lipid? For instance, it can undergo lipoxygenase catalyzed or free radical driven hydroxylation with the formation of hydroperoxide in this position, or for instance, having this amino group available, it can undergo non-enzymatic glycation or so-called Mallard reaction. Yeah? So for instance, with an elevated level of glucose in the bloodstream, so forming this glycated PAPE. And you can actually appreciate that the structures of glycated PAPE or um, hydroperoxide modified one are very different from the initial ones and the biophysical and uh, biological properties of this lipid change. 
So we define epilipidome as a subset of natural lipidome formed by lipid modification via enzymatic or non-enzymatic reactions required to regulate complex biological functions. So you can see it similar to, uh, for instance, DNA methylation events, yeah, which define epigenome, protein post-translational modifications, which give us different proteoform, and that is a kind of lipid PTMs forming the epilipidome. So again, it's all leading to the gain in the regulatory capacity of biological systems. So epilipidome can be very diverse, and we can have modification on acyl chains, we can have modification on the head groups, and we have a different modification on sterile moieties. So in our lab, we are mostly working with the enzymatic or non-enzymatic oxidation or oxygenation of lipids. Why is that important? Because uh, oxidized lipids shown to be very significant in conditions associated with redox disbalance in oxidative stress. And just to name few conditions, there is ischemia reperfusion diseases, metabolic diseases, and different cancers as well. So they can act, for instance, in the pathway regulating inflammatory responses, but they're also now uh, attracting a lot of attention in the context of ferroptosis, which is defining the uh, type of necrotic cell death, uh, typical for many degenerative diseases, which actually manifested through the lipid oxidation and the rupture of plasma membrane. So lipid oxidation can happen in different ways and just not to uh, make it too complicated. So there is different kinds of reactions with the formation of different kinds of functional groups. And the way how this reaction will happen and what kind of lipids will oxidize and to what depends on many, many conditions. So this lipidome oxidizability will depend on the substrate availability. For instance, we know that membranes, plasma membranes, yeah, are highly asymmetric with a lot of rather saturated lipids on the outer leaflet and a lot of polyunsaturated lipids in the inner leaflet. So that will actually define the oxidability in this case. There are different mediation of radical propagation and also different ways to terminate it. There are different detoxification and radical scavenging enzymes and metabolites. And at the end, if we want to answer the question, how actually, uh, what kind of oxidized lipids we are to expect in this particular lipidome, there are a lot of steps in these equations which needs to be known. From the analytical perspective, yeah, so the question is how to deal with this large sample specific diversity, but at the same time, very low abundance of oxidized complex lipids in the natural lipidomes. And that have been actually the topic of many years in my lab, where we looked for the different methods, how we can analyze all these different type of lipid oxidations, and even their lipid protein adducts. So, now we are primarily focusing on the oxidized complex lipids, such as uh, glycerophospholipids and triacylglycerols, for what we developed a number of methods where we can separate different isomers. So you can see here each color, green, they're all isomeric lipids, so the same red and blue. We define different fragmentation patterns, how our lipids can fragment, so we can we identify their structure, which we put together as well. And with this knowledge, we still want to look into the oxidized lipids in the real biological samples. We have a methods how to identify them, but the question is still remains that the search space is extremely large. So if we think about unmodified lipids, there are probably 10 to 5 species can be generated by enumeration methods. And the real range where we are working, it's like 10 to 2, between 10 to 3, something like that. If we look into the oxidized lipids, the problem becomes even bigger because the enumeration with all the different types of modification give us absolutely crazy numbers. And this is a numerous search space which we cannot really address. Additionally, 
becomes a question of the low concentration. This is the data not for the complex oxidized lipids, but for free ones, so oxylipins, prostaglandin, and leukotrienes in the blood plasma. And you can see that they are two to three orders of magnitude less than unoxidized lipids. So if we go here in a targeted manner, and we want to address this huge space, search space for the potential oxidized lipids, so we did also a calculation exercise. So if you want to go for targeting 10 to 10 imaginary lipid with the general MRM workflows, you would need like 400 years of data acquisition for one sample. So this is absolutely unrealistic. So we have to compromise. And in the last uh, minutes of this talk, I will show you some uh, workflow how, with which we came towards uh, how to find this compromise. So as I showed you before that this epilipidome, oxidized lipidome composition depends on so many factors. And one of the main factor is the lipidome composition itself. So lipidome composition will define the epilipidome. Yeah? So the content of lipids with the puffers, uh, so oxidizable acyl chains will define the final composition. So we start with acquiring our data first using a regular lipidomics workflow. So we have our samples, let's say blood plasma. First, we do lipidomics of blood plasma, and then we select N, so it depends, most oxidizable, so puffer containing or regulated in this particular condition lipids, and we perform in silica prediction of epilipidome for this particular given lipidome of interest. So you can imagine that lipidome of liver is different from lipidome of brain. So there is will be different products of oxidation and liver in brain. So and that's why we have to first know what is inside this tissue, this particular lipidome, in order to predict the oxidation products. And to do that, we use LPP Tiger. And this is a software developed by Jishuni um, back in 2017. And last year, uh, we released a new version, which is now much more powerful. So LPP Tiger is a software for identification, so for prediction and identification of oxidized lipids from LCM SMS data. And it has several algorithms. I will not go into details now, but I, here it's very important this in silica oxidation algorithm. So what LPP Tiger does, it takes the list of selected lipids, which we want to uh, think they are significant for this lipidome and predict what kind of oxidized lipids can be formed from that. And important point here that it doesn't do it just by simple enumeration, but a few years back, we invested heavily in building a metabolic networks of, lip, of PUFA oxidation. Yeah? So this is an example here for uh, one of the polyunsaturated fatty acid, and you could see to what kind of products it can oxidize via different pathways. And this kind of metabolic networks uh, uh, LPP Tiger use in order to predict your oxidized lipidome. With that predicted list, we are going for the semi-targeted LC-MSMS analysis. So we use DTA, but we uh, put inclusion lists predicted by LPP Tiger and then perform the identification of this sample-specific refined epilipidome. So having this in place, we are finally ready to move for the high throughput processing. Yeah, so when we have a lot of samples to analyze and that we do in the targeted LCMS application. So we uh, do it usually with a PRM. So now we are trying also to implement the MRM solutions here where we can now with this identified epilipidome specific for this particular tissues, uh, go for uh, as many samples as we like, um, <clears throat> perform all the statistical analysis and visualization. So this is basically this three or uh, four steps of the workflow uh, presented here. And uh, we applied this method for many different sample types. For instance, here in this study, we did it for the blood plasma aware of lean, obese, and obese with type 2 diabetes individuals, where we could identify a very specific signatures, which are characteristic not only for the obese individuals, but also for the lean one, containing very specific set of 
oxidized phosphatidyl holins, uh, cholesterol esters, and triacylglycerols. But we also applied this method in collaboration with other groups, for instance, in the context of heraptosis research, you know, where we could see the dynamics of lipid peroxidation in the different cell models, and also in the case, for instance, of a liver tissue as well. So finally, uh, if you're interested in oxidized lipids and want to know more about the fragmentation patterns, so we also put together this detailed manual for the annotation of oxidized lipids, so you can also download it for free from our website where you could see all the fragmentation patterns for the different lipid classes, but also will allow you to find the type of modification and position of this modification in acyl chains. Okay, so I'm coming to the end. So I showed you two examples of lipidomics workflow from the beginning till the end, which we use for the tissue lipidomics or epilipidomic analysis. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank, of course, first of all, my group, the uh, absolutely talented uh, scientists who are working on all of this uh, wet lab application, but also in the development of the tools, as well as our collaborators. And I would like to use the opportunity and to invite you to join us in Dresden in May this year. We have our fifth annual meeting of Epilipid Net community, but it's open absolutely for everyone. The there is no registration fee. And if you go to the uh, our web page into the event, you can know more about the meeting. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Maria, uh, a very interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, so now we're just going to have a question and answer session. We have a couple of questions that have already come through to uh, on the question and answer box. I encourage that everyone who has questions, please do type them there. And then we're going to quickly go through them with uh, Prof. Maria. Daniela, you can go ahead and read some of the questions. Thank you, Maria, for the reflection presentation. Well, we have a question that's uh, about the ammonium adapt. Um, yeah, I can see the question. Right. So, of course, uh, we have uh, ammonium formate as an additive to mobile phase. So usually in the lipidomics, the, I would say the most popular composition of the mobile phase uh, is uh, in terms of additives, you have uh, ammonium formate and formic acid or ammonium acetate and acetic acid. So the ammonium formate ions are due to the uh, presence of the additives in mobile phase. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question about the isotopic correction. Someone is wondering how do you perform type one and two correction, and if you use liposterp for this. To be honest, I cannot recall how do we do that now. Uh, it's <laughs> very possible that we do it now in Lipostar as well, because okay. uh, Lipostar is a very dynamic software and they make a lot of great updates very, very often. So, and I know at some moment we did it outside in the Excel files, but I think now it's also included in the Lipostar as well. Okay. So someone also asked if Lipostart is available, is freely available? Uh, there are a conditional uh, availability for academic sector free of charge, but I would suggest you to contact uh, them to inquire okay. that soon. Okay, so we have another question. Someone asked if there is pass overlap between different columns that you use. Um, which one has the best overall coverage if you had to make a choice? Well, if we talk about the reverse phase, uh, we so C30 and C18, so over we completely switched now to the C30 columns 
and we use them all the time. And uh, but reverse phase and helix give you very different uh, pictures, right? So you you cannot um, this, uh, the the information they deliver the separation methods would be different. So it depends of what yeah. you would like to achieve here, right? So. In this case, yes, right. uh, you can use reverse phase for one purposes. Uh, if you want to separate, for instance, beta based on that acyl chain composition, but you can also use helix and then you separate basically on the head group uh, better than by reverse phase, but you are losing the resolution for that acyl chain composition. So at the end, if you want to have a very good deep coverage, you probably would need to use both reverse phase and helix because some of the lipid classes, for instance, like acyl carnitines, you can hardly resolve on the reverse phase. They are too polar. You have to go to helix here and so on and so forth. So it's case dependent. Great. So we have another few questions from Alex. He's an EMN committee member. Uh, he says that about a stereo specific annotation and identification of DB positions in lipids, are you capable of resolving this structure level? No. And then he asks, oh, okay. We are not capable so far to resolve the um, information of the stereo specificity. SN1, SN2, except lysophospholipids. So lysophospholipids, we can separate. They usually give two signals. But for the phospholipids, not. And for the double bond position, also not yet. OK. Um, he also wants to know if do you think it is important to study the complete structural identity of lipids? And uh, what analytical solutions would you recommend for oxy oxygen activated dissociation or electron activated dissociation? I think this is really important to study the complete structural identity of the lipid, for sure. My problem with this um, that unfortunately you cannot do it all, right? So you have to compromise. And uh, since at the end of the day, we are interested in a biology behind certain pathology and so on. And the bottleneck which we have is the data integration and explaining our lipidomic signatures yeah, towards uh, the biological question. And we personally still have any problems uh, with dealing with the complexity level we already have. And I'm afraid making it at that point even more complicated with a exact double bond position and stereochemistry would be, yeah, make our life even more difficult at certain moment. But this is definitely something to look for. Yeah, this is a future where we can really define the structural annotation level in much finer details. As for the method, since we didn't use it ourselves, I cannot really recommend one or another, but I think there is a lot of great works going in both directions, right? Okay, so we have another request. Someone asked if, if you can please repeat, how do you prepare the total QC sample from tissue samples? That is a very good question. <laughs> and <laughs> that is a tricky one, yeah? That depends. Uh, the best thing would be, of course, to take the, let's say, the same amount of material before any extraction, right, from the tissue material. And if you have a pulverized tissue from the deep frozen state, that is not that a big problem. And But if you have, uh, if you are homogenizing from the, let's say, solid piece, that may be more problematic. So if it... If the workflows allow, then we collect a small piece of uh, each tissue or pulverized material before extraction to create a total QC. But it's not always possible that uh, also sometimes we do a total QC after all the extraction steps. And then we take an aliquot from each lipid extract to mix to serve as a total QC sample. 
So, for instance, we have another question about which freely available options do you consider for lipid annotation, especially of sphingolipids and general human plasma lipid? Well, there is really uh, nowadays a lot of options, right? So if you go to the uh, lipidomics tool guide on the lipid maps website, and you can choose the op so everything what is listed there, all software tools uh, are available for academia free of charge, right? So and you can choose any of them. So there are many, many, there are many solutions, right? So this is definitely a, a big step forward. When we started to do lipidomics, uh, because my background is in proteomics before, and uh, at that moment when we started doing it, there was basically absolutely nothing, and that was a nightmare. But nowadays it's, it became really much better. So I would definitely uh, refer to the lipidomics tool guide, and you can find the solution there. And um, if you have any question you can still reach out to me write me email and we can discuss something more specific if needed yeah thank you doctor for sharing your resources i would also like to say that um we have another question someone is asking about um that you use icms combination with different stationary phases so are you using dual columns Configuration? No, unfortunately not. So we don't have a setup uh, for that. So basically, we change the columns uh, for this application on the same instrument. But it could it could be done with multiple platforms, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. If uh, it's if you have multiple platforms available, then yes. So practically, okay. uh, we have one instrument for the deep lipidomic profiling uh, dedicated to that. And if we want to change the chromatography separation, then we have to change the column cup, uh, on the LC system coupled to this instrument. But if you have several instruments for that purposes, this is, would be even better, much better. OK. So Rani has asked, what normalization method would you recommend when working with cells, or is it not necessary? Yeah, normalization. This is also a huge topic <laughs> here, and there is a lot of problems in this direction, especially with tissues. Uh, but with cells, it's easier. So you can go for the cell count number, but in reality, for cells, in most of the cases, 99%, we go for the protein concentration. And uh, we do uh, it the way, so we extract lipids most of the time with a false extraction, let's say, from the cells. And then we uh, dry down the protein pellet and redissolve and measure from this protein pellet exactly from which we extracted lipids. So in cell culture, cell experiments, we go for the protein concentration. Well, um, Rani has also asked, is it always necessary to annotate lipids to the species level to make biological hypotheses in untargeted lipidomics? Yeah, this is also a very good question, of course. <laughs> there is no direct answer, yeah? So it depends, I would say, right? But uh, if you... This is to follow up uh, for also what Alice was asking just uh, before, right? How important to identify the position of the double bond and the stereochemistry of the lipid. Obviously, the more we know about structure, the uh, more we potentially can deduce uh, from the and about the biological functions in principle, right? But the species level, I think this is uh, it is quite important, and this is something what can be done relatively, let's say, so it's it's not that complicated as a double bond position where you really require a very special instrumentation as well, right, for that. So here, and the double, so the species level can provide you a lot of information. For instance, if you imagine you have a phosphatidyl choline with a combination, let's say, 36 uh, to 4. It can be in the bulk, 
composition, yeah, so 36 to 4, can be either, for instance, uh, lipid with palmitic and arachidonic acid or with a 2 times uh, 18 to 2 linoleic acid. In the biological sense, that can make a lot of difference, right? So, and also in a biophysical sense, what's the property of this lipid in the membrane or is can be uh, served as a source of, I don't know, potential lipid mediators from arachidonic acid. So I think it makes a lot of sense to have a lipid annotation to the molecular species when possible. But at the end, again, so it's, always a compromise of what you can achieve and you know, depending on the methodology and the time which you can invest in this particular project. Right. So we have two last questions. There someone asked how do we integrate the odd carbon fatty chain in a lot of lipids such as I don't hear you anymore. In biological systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's really a specific... The voice, your voice, Daniela, is breaking, I think. But I can see the question. So how do we integrate the odd carbon uh, fatty ch acyl chains in a lot of lipids? Yeah. So, yeah, we also see a lot of odd chain uh, acyl chains also sphingoid bases as well they are usually much uh, less abundant than uh, the even ones but they are definitely there and the general so if you see it in the cell culture models so they probably come from the fetal bovine ser uh, serum and uh, in the human metabolism let's say at least they are believed to be uh, partially at least the products of the microbiome uh, transformation or whatever right so and there are also some propositions about actually human metabolism derived or chain acyl chains uh, from branch fatty acid metabolism connections and so on but uh, we do see them as well quite often pretty much in every data set so Tony asked are there any workable LC tandem mass spectrometry DIA approaches? We don't have so much experience. That's why I would not comment on that so much. We tried that a few years back. Uh, the LC MS D approach works wonderfully itself, but uh, we had some problems with actually data in the, uh, uh, analysis afterwards. But I guess uh, we didn't try it back for a few years now. And I think a lot of change in this respect in terms of software solution for the deconvoluting this mixed MSMS back to uh, precursor fragment information. So I think MS dial workflows uh, actually now uh, did a lot in this direction. But unfortunately, I didn't look into this field for a few years. So I'm not up to date, I guess. So the last two questions, Lisa asked, prior extraction. I lost your voice again, but I can read the question. Uh, prior extraction, do you uh, try to have very comparable amount of biomaterial? Or do you mostly normalize afterwards? Um, this is also a very important point because uh, definitely we try to have a very comparable amount of biological material because uh, the amount of material actually uh, define the amount of solvents which you use, right? So you cannot extract uh, with the same amount of sample uh, solvents 10 milligram and 100 milligram of tissue because the extraction efficiency will uh, definitely change. And if we have to scale up in the terms of the material amount, then we also scaling up the solvent amount. So that also takes sometimes few tests to find the, uh, what is the right scaling factor in this case. And the, okay. last, the last question yeah. which I see is, is how do you handle and source fragment as compared to differential adduct? 
uh, data right. pro yep. data processing uh, wise we handle them in an absolutely very similar way so we know for uh, each lipid class what kind of in source fragments we see and we include them into the integration yeah when we integrate signals so let's say like a computationally wise treatment of uh, adducts and in source fragments is very similar and there is one more question. I know formate or acetate can be used as mobile phase modifier leading to formulated isolated adapt in negative mode. Is one better than the other? <clears throat> I think, um, I'm not sure actually we use always the formate adducts. So formate uh, modifiers and some people are using acetate. To be honest, I don't think there are any preferences in one or another. All right, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Maria Federova. That was a very beautiful presentation. And thank you for uh, taking uh, comments and questions from our audience. And thank you to all the participants and Daniela for being a great co-host. And um, we really appreciate you sharing this with us. And yeah. Until next time, in a, when we meet for our next webinar, this is goodbye. Thank you very much for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.